today's uh, session, we are beginning with the book of 1 Samuel. Shall we pray? Father, we thank you for your love towards us. Even as we had looked into the book of Judges, and we saw, Lord, that each one did whatever was right in his own eyes. And you are the one who raised up the deliverer or the savior or the judge for the nation of Israel in order to get them out of the bondage that uh, they were in due to sin and uh, rebellion. But we thank you, Lord, in spite of the repeated cycles of defeat you raised up a judge for them and that you gave them the opportunity to repent turn away from their wicked ways and made it possible for them to be set free and to love and serve you time and time again we pray as we look into the book of samuel we pray that we would be encouraged and strengthened by the faith that the final judge Samuel had. We thank you, Lord. He was not only a judge, but he was a priest and a prophet. We love you, Lord. We worship you. Help us, Lord, to truly fulfill the threefold vision in our lives, especially the men that we would continue to flow in the spirit and execute whatever we have to do prophetically in serving as a priest, as a royal priest and ruling in righteousness as a true king and judge. In Jesus mighty name we pray. Amen. Hallelujah. Amen. For a quick recap of the book of Judges, we see Israel sinning against the Lord. We see a judge like Jephthah making a foolish, foolish vow before the Lord at the cost of his daughter. And uh, it's a real tragic scene where she comes dancing with the uh, women and playing the tambourine and he says the one who comes out of the door first would be sacrificed and he loses his daughter because he had to keep his vow. There are times we may make foolish decisions, foolish vows, and it is very important to weigh our hearts and um, wait on the Lord before we make any commitments. We also see different judges like Ibzan and Elon and Abdin. We see the miraculous birth of Samson, one of the famous judges, his sinful marriage, his all his judgeship and uh, failure. It is quite a tragic scenario, especially when we know that Samson was chosen by God. He was a Nazarite. He had to be faithful to God but he was overconfident in the anointing that he had received from God and he foolishly spent his strength in various ways in going for the a Gentile woman. He also was deceived by Delilah and uh, he was going after the Philistines in a way that um, he could have avoided so much of damage and so much of loss in the matter of fields and lives. But he took his uh, anointing very carelessly. And so he lost that anointing in a way because he was disobedient to the Lord. But yet, God is a God of mercy, and as he cries out to God in the end, God intervenes in the midst of the grinding that he went through, the binding he went through, and the blinding he went through. God was so gracious to him, and he allowed him to pull down the whole temple of the Philistines. 
and the latter half of his life he destroyed and killed more of the Philistines than he did in all his life and tenure as a judge. We also see personal idolatry and tribal idolatry. God hates idolatry because idolatry seems to be in competition with our relationship with God and God hates it. He hates infidelity. He hates unfaithfulness. He hates uh, disloyalty and um, spiritual adultery. Therefore, we see that um, he brings judgment in these things. There is a sad story of the concubine who was raped and murdered and then the Levite sends a message by cutting this lady, the dead woman, the carcass, into pieces and sending them to all the tribes and stirring them up in anger. And they all come against not only Gibeah, but the whole tribe of Benjamin. And Benjamin is nearly wiped out because of a severe war, a civil war that takes place within Israel itself. Then God intervenes and they also come to their senses where they allow the women of Shiloh to be kidnapped by the Benjamites and um, the tribe once again comes to life and it is not destroyed or not eliminated completely. God is so gracious, so gracious. Well, the next book in line with the Christian Bible is um, the book of Ruth. And uh, I will not do the book of Ruth because uh, Reverend Dr. Isabella had uh, done it before she passed away, before the accident. And uh, you can find that beautiful teaching by my beautiful wife uh, on YouTube. So you can certainly go on YouTube there. And there are two sessions for the book of Ruth, uh, chapters uh, 1 and 2 in session 1, in session 2, um, that is chapters 3 and 4. It's a beautiful message of hope and redemption. Hallelujah. Now we look at um, today's session and we are doing the book of 1 Samuel. Samuel is the last judge. We see the first transition of national leadership from the priest Eli onto Samuel, the final judge, who is also a priest and a prophet. And then we see the judgeship of Samuel. So chapters 1 to chapter 7. Now we look at the overview of Samuel, 1 Samuel, and we see the first seven chapters talk about Samuel. And uh, the focus is uh, two persons, that is Eli and Samuel. And uh, it's talking about uh, the decline of judges, because naturally Samuel is the final judge. And then uh, chapter 8 to the end, that is 31, talks about the rise of kings and two other characters and the transition of leadership from Samuel the final judge to the first king, that is Saul. And then uh, the third transition of leadership from Saul to David. This whole period of time of 1 Samuel comprises of 94 years and the location is Canaan. So in this book, we are looking at four characters, Eli, Samuel, Saul and David. But today we will look at the first seven chapters. In chapter 1, let's read it, verse 1. Now there was a certain man of Ramathim, Zophim, of the mountains of Ephraim, and his name was Elkanah, the son of Jeroham, the son of Elihu, the son of Tohu, the son of Zuf, and Ephraimite. And he had two wives. He had two wives. The name of one was Hannah and the name of the other, Penina or Penina. Penina had children, but Hannah had no children. There was a barrenness 
in Hanan. This man went up from his city yearly to worship and sacrifice to the Lord of hosts in Shiloh. Also the two sons of Eli, Hophni and Phinehas, the priest of the Lord, were there. And whenever the time came for Elkanah to make an offering, he would give potions to Penina, his wife, and to all her sons and daughters. She had many children, but to Hannah he would give a double portion, for he loved Hannah, although the Lord had closed her womb. The Lord had closed her womb. Very many people in India come against the bride because she's unable to bear children, and they blame the bride. Sometimes it's the man's fault, but they will never blame the man. But here, we see it is the Lord who had closed a womb. Truly speaking, sovereignly speaking, it is God who closes the womb and he's the one who opens the womb. In my very own wife, a womb was closed. The two fallopian tubes were closed. And then miraculously, as we prayed, when the doctors had decreed that and passed a verdict that she couldn't bear children, well, we canceled that verdict, I told you some time back, and we prayed, and so many people prayed, and God opened the fallopian tubes. And then we had to wait for several seasons before Bella could bear our miracle child, Joy Bell, Esther, the Susan. And so we see always when there is a delay, in the birth of a child or in a woman being pregnant, we know that there is a, every child is special, but there is a very special child coming forth. And this you see in the whole history of Israel. You see it in Samson, you see it in Isaac, you see in all these, amen, and John the Baptist and many others. But we thank God that God not only shut Bella's womb, but she, God opened her womb. Hallelujah. Glory be to God. So here we see that um, Elkanah loved his wife, Hannah. And uh, once again, there was a taunting by her rival who provoked her severely. That is so sad. So many barren women are taunted and tortured even by in-laws sometimes for not having a child. And sometimes they are tortured for having a girl child instead of a male child or having a son. It's so sad, but I believe the days are changing. Amen. And God sovereignly is enlightening people. And we as Christians must take the initiative in educating our people and teaching them. So here Hannah is a one who comes, her name means grace, and she cries out to God in the temple. She's so hurt, she's so wounded, and she's crying out to God, and she cries out in such a way that only her lips are moving, words are not coming out of her mouth although there is a loud echo and a loud volume within a heart, a loud cry in a heart, but the words are not coming out from her lips. But God is uh, not only a God who hears, but a God who answers prayer. And here we see Eli is the priest in the temple. Unfortunately, Eli has lost it. He's not sensitive to the Holy Spirit. He's not sensitive and attuned to God. He's just um, kind of trying to fulfill his function as if it's a job and not a calling in his life. And he's watching Hannah. He's watching Hannah's lips move in his heart. He's saying this woman is drunk. She is drunk. Oh my, with alcohol. But this woman was in pain. And it's so easy for us to get judgmental. We did the, the topic on judgment last Sunday. 
we ought not to judge lest we would be judged. But we need to judge righteously. And that's the balance. Well, he judged wrongly. And it was Hannah who was really crying out to God. And God answers her prayer and gives her Samuel. Hallelujah. Isn't it wonderful? We not only see the grace of God abounding, we see faith moving God's heart. Amen. Whatever promise Hannah made to God, she kept that vow. Amen. And her vow was that, God, if you give me a son, I will dedicate him to the temple of the Lord, to serve in the temple of the Lord. I will dedicate him to you and I would release him to serve in the temple of the Lord. And she uh, does keep to her commitment and her pledge to the Lord. And she brings little Samuel. She catches him young and he's not only dedicated to the Lord, he bring, she brings Samuel faithfully when he's grown a little older to the temple of the Lord. Amen. After being weaned by her to Eli, the priest in the temple and uh, we see little Samuel begins to serve the Lord in the temple. Hallelujah. Now we see the wonderful birth of a judge and a priest and a prophet. Hallelujah. Now with thanksgiving in Hannah's heart, she comes forth singing a prophetic prayer. And many people rejoice when they just get a child and they keep the child with them. But here she is rejoicing when she releases her only child to serve in the temple of God. Isn't that wonderful? So sacrificial. And when there is a true sacrifice unto the Lord, it will result in glory. And therefore we see it is the anointing of God that rests upon little Samuel. The glory of God is upon him. We see in chapter 2, not only the Hannah's prophetic prayer, but we see the sinfulness of Eli's sons. Both of them are so corrupt, Hophni and Phineas. They are also committing fornication in the house of God, literally robbing the people, being corrupt in the house of the Lord. And God is very angry. Verse 21, it says in chapter 2, And the Lord visited Hannah so that she conceived and bore three sons and two daughters. Hallelujah. Meanwhile, the child Samuel grew before the Lord. God gave Hannah three more sons and two daughters. Isn't that wonderful? Five more children. And Samuel, little Samuel, the child Samuel, grew before the Lord. We ought to be growing before the Lord. It is not only your personal and family devotion unto the Lord, but it is a devotion to the Lord with the whole family of God in a local church as you love and serve the Lord in different ways, in making available yourself to serve in the house of the Lord, especially on a Sunday when we meet in person, in the cell church, in the care cell, in whatever way we must grow before the Lord, we must grow in the presence of the Lord. We may serve the Lord in our giving of tithes, offerings, first fruits, giving of our time, energy, serving with our talents and giftings selflessly. And you will see as you exercise your gifts unto the Lord, God will give you more and he will increase his anointing upon your life. If you are giving in finances, you will never run dry. The more you give, the more you will get. We will certainly never, God is never a debtor to any person. Whatever we sow, we will reap not the same, but 
in a manifold way, thirtyfold, sixtyfold, a hundredfold, and sometimes a thousandfold. So praise be to God. In chapter 3, what the word of the Lord does, hallelujah, we see uh, the sinfulness of Eli's son. And Eli uh, doesn't seem to warn the sons, but he really doesn't correct them. He doesn't take it very seriously. And now in the meantime, he is getting dim in his eyes. He's getting older. He's getting fatter and uh, he's getting sluggish in his spirit. He's not able to hear God. And in the meantime, Samuel has come into the house of the Lord, into the temple of the Lord, right? In chapter 3, verse 1, now the boy Samuel ministered to the Lord. He served the Lord. Hallelujah. Before Eli, who was supposed to be his covering. And the word of the Lord was rare in those days. Oh my. You know, in the book of Judges, the word of the Lord was rare. There was no widespread revelation. But the word of the Lord comes to little Samuel. Hallelujah. Amen. God is not a respecter of any person. He's already passed by Eli, who has not set his house in order. And he has come to Samuel. It says in verse 2, And it came to pass at that time while Eli was lying down in his place and when his eyes had begun to grow so dim that he could not see. Eli couldn't see now and his vision is turning dim. And before the lamp of God went out in the tabernacle of the Lord, Jehovah, where the ark of God was and while Samuel was lying down, the ark of the covenant, the ark of God, is the throne of God. It is the mercy seat where God sits. Amen. That the Lord called Samuel and he answered, Here I am. So he ran to Eli, his covering, the senior priest, and said, Here I am, for you called me. And he said, I did not call. Lie down again. And he went and lay down. Then the Lord called yet again Samuel. So Samuel arose and went to Eli and said, Here I am, for you called me. He answered, I did not call my son. Lie down again. Now Samuel did not yet know. It was the word of the Lord revealed to him. And the Lord called Samuel again the third time. So he arose and went to Eli and said, Here I am, for you did call me. Then Eli perceived that the Lord had called the boy. Therefore Eli said to Samuel, Go lie down, and it shall be, if he calls you, that you must say, Speak, Lord, for your servant hears. So Samuel went and lay down in his place. Verse 10. Now the Lord came and stood. Jehovah God came and stood and called as at other times. Are we able to see God? We don't see waves in our room, radio waves, television waves, internet signals. All are passing through our room, the Wi-Fi, but we cannot see it unless we are finely tuned either with the radio for radio waves or the television for television waves or the internet, the Wi-Fi, the mobile, the laptop. All this catches on the signals, takes on the waves and they receive the vision, the picture maybe, or the words or the sound or the voice. Amen. You must be finely tuned. In spite of not seeing God, you can certainly hear Him. So God said, Samuel, Samuel. It's now twice. And Samuel answered, Speak, 
for your servant years. Hallelujah. We ought to practice this principle so that we would experience the power of God. When you go to read God's word, God stands before you and he desires to speak to you. His Holy Spirit will quicken you on the inside and cause your receivers to receive clearly the reception of vision as well as sound. Amen. The sound of words, the sound of the voice of the Lord in the mirror of God's word, in the screen of God's word, we are able to see God. Amen. We are able to know him. We are able to see ourselves. God enlightens us. He renews our minds. Hallelujah. And so we see little Samuel hearing the voice of the Lord. Speak for your servant hears. Verse 11. Then the Lord said to Samuel, Behold, look and listen. Amen. It's always vision and hearing. Hallelujah. Behold, I will do something in Israel at which both ears of everyone who hears it will tingle. Oh my. Both ears. Samuel, Samuel. In that day I will perform against Eli all that I have spoken concerning his house from beginning to end. For I have told him that I will judge his house forever for the iniquity which he knows, because his sons made themselves vile, and he did not restrain them. He did not restrain his children from doing evil. As parents, we always need to bring in that correction and discipline over our children whenever they err from the truth or they stray away from the path of righteousness. Amen. Verse 14, And therefore I have sworn to the house of Eli that the iniquity of Eli's house shall not be atoned for by sacrifice or offering forever. So sad. So Samuel lay down until morning and opened the doors of the house of the Lord. And Samuel was afraid to tell Eli the vision. It was passing on the baton to the next generation, to the next man, Samuel, the prophet, the judge, and the priest. Hallelujah. Then Eli called Samuel and said, Samuel, my son, he answered, here I am. And he said, what is the word that the Lord spoke to you? Please do not hide it from me. God do so to you. And more also, if you hide anything from me of all the things that he said to you. Then Samuel told him everything and did nothing from him. And he said, is it the Lord? Let him do what seems good to him. Verses 19 to 21, Samuel is recognized as the new leader of Israel. Hallelujah. So Samuel grew. We need to grow. Hallelujah. And the Lord was with him and let none of his words fall to the ground. When we feed on God's word, let none of his words, none of his rhema words fall on deaf ears or to the ground, but they would pierce our hearts. They would come to our listening and we would respond in obedience to his word, to his voice. His word is his voice and his voice is his word. And all Israel from Dan to Beersheba knew that Samuel had been established as a prophet of the Lord. Hallelujah. Verse 21. Then the Lord appeared again in Shiloh. For the Lord revealed himself to Samuel in Shiloh by the word of the Lord. The Lord reveals himself to us through his word by the power and anointing of his Holy Spirit. Now in chapter 4, we see the judgment of God. 
there is the conquest of Israel by Philistia and uh, the Philistines sin against the Lord by taking the ark of God. The Israelites do sin against the Lord with the ark of God later. But the conquest of Israel by the Philistines because there is sin in Israel and God has to judge Israel. He uses Israel's enemy, the Philistines, to come against Israel and they receive favor from the Lord, not because they are more righteous than Israel, but because Israel has become wicked with Eli and his sons. So God allows a Gentile nation, a wicked nation, to overpower Israel. God wants to deal with Eli and his sons. Eli now in verse 15 of chapter 4. Eli was 98 years old. What an age! And his eyes were so dim that he could not see. So he had turned blind. Verse 16, then the man said to Eli, I am he who came from the battle and I fled today from the battle line. And he said, what happened my son? So the messenger answered and said, Israel has fled before the Philistines and there has been a great slaughter among the people. Also your two sons Hophni and Phinehas are dead and the ark of God has been captured. Oh my, the ark of God is not only the throne of God, but it speaks of the presence of God. It is the symbol of the presence of God. So the glory has departed. Then it happened when he made mention of the ark of God that Eli fell off the seat backward by the side of the gate and his neck was broken and he died. For the man was old and heavy and he had judged Israel for 40 years. Very significant number 40, trial and testing. Now his daughter-in-law Phineas's wife was with child due to be delivered. And when she heard the news that the ark of God was captured and that her father-in-law and her husband were dead, she bowed herself and gave birth for her labor pains came upon her. And about the time of her death, the women who stood by her said to her, Do not fear, for you have borne a son. But she did not answer, nor did she record it. Then she named the child Ichabod, saying, The glory has departed from Israel. Ichabod, a terrible name to give a son. The glory of God has departed. Watch what name and which name you give your children. A good name is to be chosen rather than riches. That is what Proverbs chapter 22 and verse 1 says. Hallelujah. It is important to give a good name to a child. But here we see it is a problem. The glory has departed from Israel because the ark of God had been captured and because of her father-in-law and her husband. And she said, the glory has departed from Israel, for the ark of God has been captured. Now you look at chapter 5 and we see the Philistines sin against the ark of God. Then the Philistines took the ark of God and brought it from Ebenezer to Ashdod. When the Philistines took the ark of God, they brought it into the house of Dagon and set it by Dagon. Dagon is half fish and half human, and that's their God. 
because the Philistines were along the coast of the Mediterranean Sea and they were worshipping the fish, the fish god Dagon. And when the people of Ashdod arose early in the morning, there was Dagon fallen on its face to the earth before the ark of the Lord. You see that in that picture there, in that slide. So they took Dagon and set it in its place again. And when they arose early in the morning, there was Dagon fallen on its face to the ground before the ark of the Lord, the head of Dagon and both of the palms of its hands were broken off on the threshold. Only Dagon's torso was left of it. Dagon, the false god, had to bow down this dumb, dead, blind, deaf idol, this false god, had to also bow down before the presence of the Ark of the Covenant, before the presence of God, hallelujah, hallelujah, and God destroyed the idol. So many times we have seen wonderful testimonies of altars just crumbling down when we pray and fast and we enjoy the presence of God. So many times it has happened and idols have broken, idols have crashed, Verse 5, therefore neither the priest of Dagon nor any who come into Dagon's house tread on the threshold of Dagon in Ashdod to this day. Verse 6, but the hand of the Lord was heavy on the people of Ashdod and he ravaged them and struck them with tumors, both Ashdod and its territory. God came down with a heavy hand on the Philistines and upon those cities. Oh God, all was struck with these deadly tumors. Verse 12, and the men who did not die were stricken with the tumors and the cry of the city went up to heaven. So God judged them with death. Okay, now chapter 6. Now the ark of the Lord was in the country of the Philistines seven months. And the Philistines called the priests and diviners, saying, What shall we do with the ark of the Lord? Tell us how we should send it to its place. So they said, If you send away the ark of the God of Israel, do not send it empty but by all means return it to him with a trespass offering. Then you will be healed and it will be known to you why his hand is not removed from you. And they said, what is the trespass offering which we shall return to him? Then they answered, five golden tumors and five golden rats according to the number of the Lord's of the Philistines, for the same plague was on all of you and on your lords. Oh my, from the leaders down to the grass root. Verse 5, therefore you shall make images of your tumors and images of your rats that ravage the land, and you shall give glory to the God of Israel. Perhaps he will lighten his hand from you, from your gods, and from your land. You see the similar? The rats. You see some golden rats in some of the festivals that the unbelievers celebrate. You know what I'm talking about. Well, and then verse 7. Now therefore make a new car, take two milk cows, which have never been yoked, and hitch the cows to the cart and take their calves home away from them. Then take the ark of the Lord and set it on the cart and put the articles of gold which you are returning to him as a trespass offering in a chest by its side. Then send it away and let it go and watch 
if it goes up the road to its own territory, to Beth Shemesh, then he has done us this great evil. But if not, then we shall know that it is not his hand that struck us, it happened to us by chance. Today, many people with unbelief are still believing in chance and not the choice. But also, they believe in lady luck and by flukes and all kinds of, they go on saying these things, but believe in God. It is so important to know the truth. Certain disasters come and people offer prayers and sacrifices to false gods. And when believers pray and something good happens, the unbelievers think that they have prayed to their God. And that is why this has happened. But we know our God is a living God and he's the living God. And he is a God who not only hears prayers, he answers prayers. Hallelujah. He's a God who sees. He's a God who hears. Then from verses 10 onwards, we see the Israelites sin with the ark of God. Then the man did so, and they took two milk cows and hitched them to the ark and shut up their calves at home. And they set the ark of the Lord on the cart and the chest. They went on in verse 12, then the cows headed straight for the road to Beth Shemesh and went along the highway, lowing as they went and did not turn aside to the right hand or to the left. And the lords of the Philistines went after them to the border of Beth Shemesh. Now the people of Beth Shemesh were reaping their wheat harvest in the valley and they lifted their eyes and saw the ark and rejoiced to see it. Then the ark came into the field of Joshua of Beth Shemesh and stood there. A large stone was there. So they split the wood of the cart and offered the cows as a burnt offering to the Lord. The Levites took the ark of the Lord and the chest that was with it in which were the articles of gold, and put them on the large stone. Then the men of Beth Shemesh offered burnt offerings and made sacrifices the same day to the Lord. So when the five lords of the Philistines had seen it, they returned to Ekron the same day. These are the golden tumors which the Philistines returned as a trespass offering to the Lord, one for Ashdod, one for Gaza. You know, the problems are still there in Gaza. One for Ashkelon, one for Gath, one for Ekron. And the golden rats, according to the number of all the cities of the Philistines belonging to the five lords, both fortified cities and country villages tumors and rats remember the rat plague we experienced some time back so rat even as far as the large stone of abel on which they set the ark of the lord which stone remains to this day in the field of joshua of beth shemesh then he struck the men of beth shemesh because they had looked into the ark of the Lord. He struck 50,070 men of the people and the people lamented because the Lord had struck the people with a great slaughter. And the men of Beth Shemesh said, Who is able to stand before this holy Lord God, and to whom shall it go up from us? So they sent messengers to the inhabitants of Kizjat, Jearim, saying, The Philistines have brought back the ark of the Lord. Come down and take it up with you. Now into chapter 7, the acceptable return 
of the ark in verses 1 and 2. The house of Israel lamented after the Lord. Amen. Now Israel returns to the Lord after lamenting. Uh, we see in verses 3 to 6. Then Samuel spoke to all the house of Israel saying, If you return to the Lord with all your hearts, then put away the foreign gods and the Ashtoreths from among you and prepare your hearts for the Lord and serve him only and he will deliver you from the hand of the Philistines. Israel even today has to remember they have to turn back to the living God. Amen. They have to recognize that Yahushua, the Jew, is the true Messiah. Amen. And yet we see the Philistines attacking them constantly from Gaza. So the children of Israel put away the Baals and the Ashtoreths and served the Lord only. Hallelujah. There are many gods of this world of mammon and other materialism. And Samuel said, gather all Israel to Mizpah, and I will pray to the Lord for you. So they gathered together at Mizpah, drew water and poured it out before the Lord in a cleansing. Hallelujah. And they fasted that day and said there, we have sinned against the Lord. And Samuel judged the children of Israel at Mizpah. Hallelujah. It is important to acknowledge whenever you have sinned against God. Acknowledge the sin, forsake the sin, and turn to the Lord. Hallelujah. Israel's victory over Philistia. When you get right with God, there is victory all the way. Hallelujah. From verses 7 to 17. Verse 17 says, but he always returned to Ramah, for his home was there. There he judged Israel, and there he built an altar to the Lord. Whenever you are going for a battle, you need to raise an altar. When you have victory in thanksgiving and praise and worship, you need to build an altar. Raise an altar. Hallelujah. An altar is not a wooden shelf against the wall, not even an altar that one would make as a platform. But the altar is truly in spirit a meeting place between you, your family and God, the church and God around his holy word. That is very important to know. It must always end with an altar. When we complete a milestone in life regarding our age or wedding anniversaries, different kinds of anniversaries, or you come to God with thanksgiving, raise an altar of thanksgiving, praise and worship. Amen. Hallelujah. Our Heavenly Father, we thank you for your holy word. We thank you for the instruction we receive in the Bible teachings from your word. And as we hear it, we would run to do it so that we would receive faith in our lives and we would walk in the righteous path. Help us, O Lord, to judge ourselves in the mirror of God's word that we would not be judged. Father, thank you for your only begotten son, Yahushua, who took the judgment upon himself, who took our sins upon himself, our curses, our guilt, our shame, our condemnation. We thank you, Lord Jesus, for saying yes to the Father and dying for us on the cross as a perfect sacrifice 
and rising from the dead, your shed blood cleanses us from all sin. And your Holy Spirit that caused you to rise from the dead is resident, president in our lives. And we pray that we would grow in your grace, grow in your knowledge, be sensitive to your voice and your word. To hear your voice, to hear your word by the power and anointing of your Holy Spirit. Bless your people watching on Zoom as well as on YouTube. Fill them with your love. Fill them with your power. Fill them with sound judgment that they would discern and judge righteously and live a life that is pleasing to God. We love you, Lord. We worship you. We give you all the glory. In the name of Adonai, Yahushua, HaMashiach, and God's people shout, Amen and Amen.